your body just protected you from a really bad burn. Reflexes help our bodies maintain homeostasis for us without having to even think about reacting. Your nervous system just acted in concert with your muscular system. This particular type of reflex you just experienced is called a flexor reflex, which is also called a withdrawal reflex, which makes sense because you just withdrew your finger from the hot oven rack. This is also an epsilateral reflex, which all occurs on one side of your body. Your body felt that this reflex was so important that it blocked out all the other reflexes just so that it could protect you from this burn. Pretty cool, huh? I'm going to put it down now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how the whole reflex arc actually works. The first step in the reflex arc was the receptor in your finger detecting pain from the hot oven. This little bird is called a no -see receptor, and boy does she squawk loud when she receives a painful stimulus. Her action potential is so loud, in fact, that the sensory neuron gallops really fast to send a message up the afferent pathway to notify the spinal cord and the central nervous system. Now here's the cool part about the whole process. Because your body needs to send these signals lightning quick to protect you from getting burned, your spinal cord can process all this information and come to your rescue without needing to directly involve the brainstem. Your brainstem is important for your body to be able to regulate breathing and your heart rate, but the reflex arc acts independently, which is significant in that it saves you time and allows you to react more quickly. Alright, back on track. So once he's made it up all the afferent pathway, the impulse is going to travel across the dorsal root of the spinal cord. The dorsal roots house the axons of afferent fibers, but their cell bodies remain in the dorsal root ganglion, which is the bigger bulbous part of our pathway. The ganglion's kind of like the headquarters for the signal so that there's one central point of all the signals coming in. The axons then go through the dorsal horns of the gray matter in the spinal cord to be processed in the integration center. Now that the queen has received the message from the sensory neuron, she will dictate what happens next. This is a polysynaptic reflex, so it will have more than one message to send, like this. The inner neuron is between the sensory and the motor neuron so that she can send the signals through the appropriate pathways. Her messages will be sent out of the spinal cord through the ventral horn, and the motor neurons, let's see, she can send the signals through the appropriate pathways. Her message will be sent out of the spinal cord through the ventral horn and feed into the ventral root and out of the efferent pathway towards the skeletal muscles. The inner neuron is going to send one message down the efferent pathway through a motor neuron that will bark so loudly that she will alert the effector at the biceps brachii muscle. This is called flexor stimulation. The effector will then respond by contracting the biceps brachii muscle, which will flex your arm. See if you can flex this big arm muscle for me. As I hold your wrist, pull it up. Feel it? Right here? Mm -hmm. Okay, so at the same time, the queen, the inner neuron, is going to send another message down an efferent pathway through a motor neuron that will alert the effector at the triceps brachii. The triceps brachii opposes the flexion of your arm and it will need to be inhibited so that your arm will not be able to extend while it's flexing to prevent your hand from being burned. Try out your triceps this time. I'll hold your wrist again but pull backwards. Feel it? Okay, mm -hmm. so now that we've gone through the whole pathway, let's look at the big picture. These neurons that we saw um, feeding into and out of the spinal cord through the dorsal and ventral roots actually end up coming together to make spinal nerves um, which run up and down your whole spinal cord and lead out to all the parts of your body. Yeah, kind of like that actually. Cool. Let's also look at the differences between the white and gray matter. Gray matter is mostly clusters of neural cell bodies called nuclei. The color difference is created by the white matter's axons being covered by myelin sheets. The myelin sheets surround the nerve fiber like this and insulate it so that information can pass through the nerve even faster. The myelin sheets in the central nervous system or Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system sort of look like this. Alright, you got all that? Remember, there's going to be a test at the end. 
Now, we've left out a huge part of the equation that I hinted at earlier on. It's called action potential. And it has to occur in both the neurons and the muscle once the effector receives a signal from the motor neuron. Kind of like that. It's going to travel straight through. Okay, so we're going to use these glasses of water and food coloring to demonstrate action potential. This large glass is going to represent the cell body of our neuron and the dendrites poking out of it, which will receive the initial stimulus. When a dendrite receives the stimulus um, and relays it to the cell body to be processed, a graded potential occurs. This means that the stimulus causes gated sodium ion channels to open and sodium floods in like this. As the sodium ions diffuse, the membrane becomes depolarized and the wave of depolarization spreads and reaches the axon hillock right here. Now at the axon hillock, we're entering the long highway of the neural cell called the axon, okay? Now, as we travel down the axon in one direction, we'll need to depolarize each segment of the axon enough so that it will trigger an action potential Squeeze it. In the next segment of the axon, this is called reaching the threshold stimulus. Each time a segment is depolarized, it means that it becomes more positive in relation to the outside of the membrane. Now, once we get to the end of the axon, or the presynaptic terminal, the depolarization will trigger another type of voltage-gated channel, hold on, which will allow calcium ions to flood into the boutons. The rush of calcium then triggers vesicles to release a specific neurotransmitter. In the case of muscle action potential, the neurotransmitter required is called acetylcholine. The neurotransmitters are very specific. Let's see the acetylcholine in this one. Okay, the neurotransmitters are very specific since they will only bind with a specific receptor after they diffuse across this synaptic cleft. Look at Avery's toy, for example. The flower isn't going to fit in any of these other shapes besides the flower. That's the only one that it'll bond to, just like a neurotransmitter. Once the neurotransmitter binds with ligand gate and ion channels, one of two events will occur. Either the channels will open and allow sodium ions to pass, causing an excitatory postsynaptic potential through depolarization, as in with the muscles. Or the channels will open and allow potassium or chloride ions to pass, which will cause an inflammatory postsynaptic potential through hyperpolarization. These are opposite effects since the depolarization makes the membrane less negative and the hyperpolarization makes the membrane more negative. Once again, threshold will have to be established before the action potential will spread throughout the postsynaptic membrane. In the muscle fibers, the action potential will need to continue to spread across the sarcolemma and down through the perforating T-tubules, which will trigger the release of calcium ions from the sarcoplasmic reticulum so that a cross bridge can be formed. Now that I've completely talked your head off, can you at least tell me one thing you learned from all this? To, um, to wear mittens. To wear what kind of mittens? <laughs> Other mittens. <laughs>